Well, good morning to you this morning. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see you on this uh, chilly morning, this chilly Sunday morning. And uh, glad you're here. Looking forward to worship uh, together today. Uh, I've got just a couple of announcements or so to make. have some thank you notes from Mr. Hiram. Uh, just uh, thanking the church for all of the calls, the visits, the food, and all the acts of kindness that were uh, shown uh, to him during uh, the loss of Miss Jimmy. So I just want to especially continue uh, to remember him in prayer. And we'll, I'll have those notes back in the back back there uh, for you uh, to be able uh, to see them. Uh, also, uh, just a reminder to you, our reading through the New Testament, uh, we're moving right along. We will... Uh, finish uh, uh, Mark uh, tomorrow, and then we'll have four chapters in Galatians this next week uh, that we'll be reading as we read uh, through the New Testament. So uh, just a, a reminder uh, about that. Uh, craft class coming up, sign up for that. Also, uh, church uh, fellowship uh, on February the 11th, I believe it is, to that afternoon. There's a sign up uh, back there in the back for that as well. Uh, finger foods for that, so just especially uh, remember that uh, little time of fellowship on February the 11th for that. Uh, I think those are the announcements at the end of the service for our members' financial statements. Andy will have those to give out back there uh, as you leave today, so just especially uh, remember uh, that. Uh, our, our prayer list this morning, uh, have some names that want to add to the list. Let me give those to you uh, first uh, today. Uh, Miss Diane Morrison, she's been away from us a couple of weeks now because of sickness, but just especially uh, remember her uh, in our prayers. And then uh, Mr. Pete Hicks is with us this morning. He's got some upcoming tests on February the 6th that we're concerned about, so just want to be praying about uh, that for him. So I want to add uh, Pete to the prayer list this morning. Uh, also, uh, Carter Carroll is a... Uh, a student at St. James in Montgomery, and he was uh, killed in a hunting accident this weekend. So just especially remember that family and also St. James School in the loss of that student there. That's Carter Carroll. Uh, E.J. had asked to add his brother uh, Donnie to our prayer list. Uh, Waters uh, got some upcoming tests. We'll know more about those tests once they're done, but just especially remember uh, Donnie in your prayers. And then uh, Frank uh, Decent had asked us uh, to uh, be praying for Thomas Fowler, a friend of his, a co-worker, uh, lost uh, his mother this week, so especially remember that. And then, of course, uh, Miss Loretta Jackson and, uh, and her family, the Brocks, uh, all connected uh, with Miss Kenny and uh, Miss Loretta's sister, and that, that funeral was yesterday. So just especially remember those families. Those are the ones that uh, add to the list today. And then I want to just go down the list before we have our scripture reading and prayer. Uh, Felix Andrews, Ann Arrington, uh, Rhonda Baggett, Dwight Bennett, Mr. Hiram Beasley, uh, Robbie Lyles, uh, Kim uh, Brown, Max Bush, Walter Carrier, Wayne Carrier, Justin Chandler, Tommy Kendrick, and Tommy has upcoming surgery the 24th, so just especially remember Tommy in your prayers. Mabry Cook, uh, Kay Evans, Patricia Grigger, Evan L. Halford, uh, Thad House, Berlin Finley, John Andrews, Pete Wolf, Cheryl Johnston, Zach Williams, Cecilia McCullough, Steve Moon, uh, Brenda Creech, uh, Jenny Sapp, Jimmy Cook, Jackie Skipper, Becky Smith, Stephanie McClellan, and she continues to have very serious health issues and uh, just really need to pray for her and for the prognosis going forward. Doesn't look good for them. Just especially remember her and her mom, Sarah, that listens to us often. And uh, so just especially pray for that family. Uh, Janet uh, Stringer, Verley Stuckey, Laura Salter, Daryl Levi, Lena Warren, Fred McIntyre, Bessie Watts, John Woodward, Dustin Crawford, Janice Victory, Versa Higdon, uh, Mary Ann Taylor, uh, Beth Lee, Brenda Wilson, uh, Hank Long, Cora Oswald, Jimmy and Janice Booker, Francis Shadburn, Jeff Baggett, Kevin Reeves, uh, Melanie Johnson, Melissa Robinson, and Melissa's surgery is upcoming the 31st, so one continue to remember her and pray for her. 
uh, Jesse Hagburn, Gail Armstrong, Patricia McCullough, uh, Clifford Higdon, Carolyn Leonard, Dan Spikes, Amy Anderson, Ralph Deason, Lorenzo Calvin, uh, Frank Williams, Eugenia Brown, Mike Luther, Mary Johnson, uh, Ava Anderson, Danny McLeod, Michael Brown, Joe Wright, Rick Shows, Shannon Stacy, Barry Hall, and that's Mary Ann's brother. And uh, he is not doing well as, uh, also, so especially remember uh, Barry and that family. Uh, Jerry New, Mary Brown, Andy and Judy Anderson, Donna Griffin, and she's here today. Let's give her a little hand of encouragement right there. Doing good, progressing well, and it's good to see her and her smiling face when she came in this morning. Uh, Larry uh, Smith, Johnny Teal, Bill Bender, Taylor Crawley, uh, Brenda Welch, uh, Drew Skipper, Randall Copeland, Bill uh, Coker, Gail Beck, Van Sims, Bessie Barnett, and Eddie Braxton. Those are the names that, that are on our prayer list. If you would, open your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, the first chapter, and I want to read these verses 9 through 20 today as we finish up the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, verses 9 through 20. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like, uh, were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like the fine brass as it refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things uh, which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand are the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Would you bow together with me as we pray today? Heavenly Father, I do come to you this morning thankful for this day thankful for the privilege that we have to worship together. Lord, thankful for the way that you walked with us, encouraged us, and ministered to us through your Spirit in the weeks, in the days of this last week. And Father, as I come this morning, I realize that there are continued needs in people's lives. I realize that there are people who are still suffering and struggling with sickness, with illness, with the loss of loved ones. And Father, we turn to you this morning to meet the needs of those individuals. Father, I pray that your presence, your power, your comfort, and your grace will sustain, strengthen, and be a solid source of supply in their lives. Lord, I thank you 
for this church, this fellowship of people that love you and love your word. And Lord, I pray today that as we study together, as we worship together, that our voices as well as our hearts will be lifted up to you and we'll give you the rightful praise that you desire. Help us today, Father, to see you as you are presented to us in this passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 1. And we'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it wonderful that today we have the reassurance that God is everywhere? Listen to this affirmation of that. <clears throat> Questions enter my mind. What is going ahead of me and for all of mankind? Listen, fear not tomorrow. God is all. your future unsure? Are you dreading the coming dawn, a long day to endure? Fear not tomorrow, God is all Oh!
Open up your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, the first chapter, and we're going to be studying together these verses 9 through 20 today as we finish up uh, our study in the book uh, of this first chapter of Revelation. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, a vision of victory. A vision of victory. We've already discovered that Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And in this first chapter, John provides for us a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus on one occasion in that passage asked His disciples a very important question. Here's what Jesus asked them in Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus asked them this question. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? So he wanted to know, hey, what's the talk out there on the streets, up and down the byways of life? What are people saying about me? And here's what the disciples answered. They said to Jesus, some say that you are John the Baptist, and some of them say that you are Elijah. Some say you are Jeremiah and others say that you are one of the prophets. And then, of course, Jesus asked them the question, well, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? I want to suggest to you that that question is still an important question to be asked and answered today. Who is Jesus? In fact, we live in a world where the research is showing that while many people believe that Jesus was a real person, They believe that Jesus literally did live and that He literally did walk on this earth. What we are discovering from the researchers is that the younger generation is not nearly as quickly to believe that Jesus is the the sinless Son of God. In fact, one group of scholars said this. They said, Jesus' question, Who do you say I am? has been redirected by the current culture to this. Who do you want me to be? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know you don't get to choose who Jesus is this morning. You have to accept who Jesus is, the Jesus who is presented to us in the Bible. And that's exactly what John does in this first chapter. Now, I got you. I, I want to let you know. John saw Jesus in a different way from most of the times we think about Jesus. When John saw Jesus in this vision we're going to study this morning, he did not see the meek and lowly Galilean who walked on this earth. No, he saw the one who is coming back one of these days in great victory. When John saw Jesus in this first chapter, he did not see the Jesus who who died bloody and bruised and beaten on the cross of Calvary? No, he saw a Jesus who was coming back riding on a white horse to be the victor over this world. That's the Jesus that John got a glimpse of in this first chapter and that he is going to describe for us as we study these verses together today. Now here's the thought. When you study these verses 9 through 20, you're going to discover that once John got this vision or this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of His glory, all of His majesty, and all of His beauty, it had a tremendous impact on his life. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, you can't come into the presence of the living Lord Jesus and not be changed when you get into His presence. And that's what happened to John. His life was changed. And the key thought, that I want to lay on your hearts this morning is this. A personal encounter with Jesus will always produce a powerful experience. A personal encounter with Jesus will always produce a powerful experience. We see that happening in John's life and I think it is the true testimony of every believer who's ever had a true personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's take a look at this vision of victory. And there are several things I want you to notice about it as we study these verses of Scripture together. Here's the first thought that I want you to notice from verses 9, 10, and 11. I call it the revealer 
of the vision. The revealer of the vision. I want you to notice with me for a few moments the human instrument that God used to give us this wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ. Of course, I'm referring to the author of the book. I'm referring to John. He is the revealer of the vision. He is the human instrument that God used to give us the revelation. And there are three things about John that I want you to see. And here's why it's important. See, God always desires to use people. God wanted to use John, and John was usable, and God used him. Guess what? God wants to use us this morning as well. And if we'll be usable, if we'll present ourselves to Him, He can use us as human instruments to be a blessing to the world and a blessing to ourselves as well. So let's take a look at this man, John. Three things I want you to notice about him. Number one, who he was. Real simple, who he was. He identifies himself for us in verse 9 when he says simply, I, John. I, John. Well, what do we know about John? Well, we know that he was one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that John had a brother by the name of James. We know that those two brothers heard the call of Jesus and they followed Jesus and, and they began to follow Jesus and to minister in His name. Probably John came to know Jesus at an early age in his life. Probably he was in the teenage years of life whenever he heard that call and he began to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, following Jesus is the most important decision that a person will ever make. Can I get an amen on that? Following Jesus is the most important decision. You may make tremendous decisions. You may make life-changing decisions. You may make decisions that will change the future of your family, but there is no greater decision a person ever makes than following Jesus. John chose to follow Jesus, and the neat thing about it is now we come to the end of his life. He's probably an older man by now, and he's still following Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good thing right there? Isn't that an encouraging thing to us right there? Brother, you can follow Jesus, you can start young, and you can follow Him all the way to the very end of life. That's who He was. God greatly used Him. He gives us five books in our New Testament. He he gives us the Gospel of John. He, He wrote that. He gives us the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then He gives us the book of Revelation. Now, of course, you understand that the Bible has a dual authorship to it, don't you? You understand that? The Bible has a dual authorship. What do you mean by that, preacher? Here's what I mean. Men wrote down the words of Scripture. John was a man used of God to write down the words of Scripture. But you also understand, don't you, that behind the writings of the men were the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, the Bible puts it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 when it says, No prophecy came by man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. I got news for you. If God's Holy Spirit had breathed the word into John, he wouldn't have seen nothing, nor would he have been able to write a single thing. That's the same way with Paul or anybody else. In fact, let me tell you, A Sunday school teacher won't be able to be effective unless that Sunday school teacher lets the Holy Spirit of God work through them. A preacher will never be effective unless he lets the Holy Spirit of God work through him and neither will any member in the family of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit of God operating in our lives. That's who he was. Who he was? John the beloved disciple, a follower of Jesus who had committed his life to the Lord and was used greatly of Him. Second thing I want you to notice about Him, not only who He was, I want you to notice where He was. You'll notice in verse 9 that it says, I, John, a brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's where he was. He was on the island of Patmos. He had been banished there. And I want you to notice that he, he, he says to these believers, as this letter is sent, who are going through difficult times, you notice he said, I'm your brother. And, and, and you know, I don't think we ought to 
take that too lightly in the church. You know, sometimes we say, yeah, brothers and sisters. L listen, that, that's, a reverent, that's a reverent phrase right there, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, sometimes I think that we hold truer allegiance to our earthly family than we do our spiritual family. Well, I want to tell you something. This spiritual family is pretty important right here. In fact, guess what? This spiritual family is going to have more longevity attached to it than the physical one you've got. I, oh, I believe we're going to know one another when we get to heaven and all those kinds of things, absolutely. And we'll talk about some of that maybe uh, toward the end of the year when we try to wrap this whole book up. But, hey, there is special ties that we have as the people of God. And every Sunday we come together, we ought to celebrate the fact that not only do we have an earthly family given to us by God, we also have a heavenly family given to us by God as well. And we are brothers and sisters. And notice he says, companion in tribulation. You see that? See, John just simply wanted them to know, look, I'm going through tough times just like you're going through tough times. Hey, God's people go through tough times. You do know that, don't you? They go through tough times. We experience tough times. That's why we ought to be encouraging to one another. And that's why we ought to comfort one another. And that's why we ought to be able to lean on one another, ladies and gentlemen, because all of us are going through something. You just may not know that friend of yours is walking through it. That's who he was. That's where he was. And then I want you to notice what he said. Notice what he said. This is so important. I got I to, gotta, you know, kind of be hesitant not dwell too long right here. But, but notice what he says in, in, this, in this verse. He said he was, he was on the Isle of Patmos. And then he says he was there for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10, this phrase is so important. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now right there you have two locations that identify the child of God. He, he gives us two locations. If you, if you look in verse 9, he says he was on the island of what? Patmos. That was his earthly location. Do you see it? His earthly location. Where was he located? He was on Patmos. If we'd have had a, you know, geographic, we could give you 210 Patmos Street or something other. That's where he was. But then you notice in verse 10, he, he's got another location. He's in the what? He's in the Spirit. That's his spiritual location. Guess what? Every child of God in the house this morning, you got an earthly location. That's where you live, physical address. But you also got a heavenly location. That's your spiritual address. You're, you, you've got a connection to heaven through the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And folks, we, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life because it's the Holy Spirit that connects us to heaven. And without that connection, we won't be able to have the power that we need to do what we ought to do in the world. You know, my wife, my sweet little wife, she is. My sweet little wife gave me some time back one of these, uh, one of these trail cameras that will send that picture to your phone. Now, can you believe it? And you know what? She got me one of those things and I went out there to set it up. And just would you know it, I have some locations so far out that when I set that thing up, it said searching for GPS. And so I waited for a little bit, and it's still searching for GPS. And so I waited a little bit, and guess what? It's still searching for GPS. You know what I found out? If that thing keeps searching, it ain't going to do you no good. It's got to make a contact. It's got to make a connection. And when it connects, watch this, when it connects a signal in the sky, it then says connected to the GPS and it can function properly and send you a picture to your phone. But until the connection in the sky is made, it can sit on the tree for eternity and it ain't going to do you nothing. And could I just tell you this morning, until a connection in the sky is made, but God's people, we can sit on the pew for eternity and we ain't going to accomplish much. It's only when we get in the spirit of the living God, ladies and gentlemen, that things happen. And hey, sometimes we come to church and we ain't in the spirit, are we? 
Oh, come on here now. Y'all, now, we might be in something, but we, we ain't in the spirit. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We come in grumbling to one another. We, and then, oh, whoa, we can act like saints when the door of the church opens up, you know. But hey, in the spirit on the Lord's day was when something magnificent happened in John's life. That's, that's who he was. That's where he was. That's what he said. And that's the life that you and I need to live. In the Spirit on the Lord's day. In the Spirit on Monday. In the Spirit on Tuesday. In the Spirit, amen, on Wednesday. In the Spirit of God. That's the revealer of the vision. Now secondly, let me talk to you about the recipients of the vision. Because notice what John does in verse 11 and following. John says to us here, verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And he said, I I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, this is verse 11, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then in verse 12 he says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, let me talk to you about the recipients of the letter. The recipients of this vision. Because John sees these lampstands. Now, we know know two things. We know, one, the meaning of the lampstands. We know that the lampstands represented the churches. In fact, over in verse 20, if you go to verse 20 of this chapter, he, he, he defines it for us. He unravels the mystery. He says in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches. Those were the pastors. The word angel means messenger. And then he says the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So these lampstands are the churches. That's the meaning of the lampstands. Here were seven literal churches. And we're going to begin to study them next Sunday. Seven literal churches. And they, had, they were placed in Bible days, in strategic locations, if you had a map and you put them on the map, you would discover that there was a, that that they were all on on major thoroughfares, major traveling routes in those days. So these churches had strategic places. God had a specific mission, a specific purpose for them to serve. Guess what? God has placed us at a crossroads. I believe that. He's given us a strategic location as Olive Branch Baptist Church. And God wants to use us in a specific way. That's the meaning. Uh, But what about the the, the message of the lampstands? What is the message? Now, lampstands, candlesticks, sometimes they're translated. Really, it takes us back into the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament picture. Remember, it, 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 it amazes me how we study these verses of Scripture and I got not a clue. I'm telling you, I don't have a clue how God works it all out. But what, what did we study last year? We studied the tabernacle, remember? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing how God gave, gave us that study and now we're studying a book in the Bible that's mentioned in lampstands. You remember, in that tabernacle, there was that, that seven golden lampstand that was there and it had bowls and there were wicks in the bowls and there was oil that was poured in and the wicks had to be trimmed. Well, what was the purpose of the of the lampstand in the tabernacle? Light. It gave off light. You could see the other articles of furniture. You could see how to get around. Well, guess what? What's the purpose of a church today? It's to shine, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to shine. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But then he came around in Matthew 5, 14 to say, hey, but you're the light of the world. Now don't misunderstand. The church really, like the lampstand in the Old Testament, isn't the light. It's a holder of the light. It's a bearer of the light. You see, Jesus is the light. What are we? We're a holder of that light. We're a container of that light. And as we allow Jesus to operate in us through the Holy Spirit, then our life shines brightly for God and oh, how we need to shine in this dark world today. Amen? Amen. That's the message and that's the meaning of the lampstand. So so you've got the, the revealer of the vision, John. You've got the recipients, the seven churches. And we're going to begin to talk about that next week. But then I want you to notice the revealing of the vision. Because John now focuses in on the heart 
of the vision and really the heart of the book, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you notice he begins to describe it. He said in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Verse 13, he says, And in the midst of those seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. One like the Son of Man. That's a favorite phrase used in the Bible to describe the Lord Jesus. And now, John is going to describe Him to us. Two things about Him I want you to notice. First of all, I want you to notice the clothing of the Son of Man. You notice it says He had clothing. Notice in, in verse number uh, 13, he says, In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. He's clothed. Now, these are the clothes of the high priest. Sometimes somebody says, Well, you know, clothes make the man. No, I disagree. Clothes mark the man. They don't make him. They mark him. You take the clothes of a policeman or the clothes of, a, of the sheriff, they mark him. They identify him. They point him out as a person of authority. Hey, you, you, take a, you take a referee on a Friday night on a football field. He don't look like all the rest of them on the field, does he? No. You know what makes him different? His clothes make him different. And it are, it's the stripes that give him the authority to throw the flag and call the penalty. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know when John looked and saw the one like the Son of Man, he saw Him clothed. He saw Him clothed in the royal robes of the priest. He saw Him clothed in the royal robes of the king. He saw Him clothed in the royal robes of the one who one of these days is going to come back and judge this world. That's what he saw. But then notice quickly, not only the clothing of the Son of Man, but the characteristics. Now, I've got to move through these quickly. I could do a sermon just on this, but I'm going to resist. I want you to notice what he says. He, he, he gives a beautiful sevenfold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I put notes there in your outline so that you would have them because I was going to move through them pretty quickly. But, but notice, he begins in, in verse 16. He says, His head and his hair were white like wool as white as snow. That says to us that He's the pure one. He's absolutely pure, ladies and gentlemen. Never been a thought run through the head of Jesus that shouldn't have been there. Never been a thought of sin that ever entered into the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever thought about it? Jesus never has ever had a guilty conscience. You know why He never had a guilty conscience? Because He never committed anything against the Father that was wrong. He is the pure one. And then you notice He says His eyes. His eyes were like the flame of fire. That says to me He's the penetrating one. We could put it this way. He's got x-ray vision. Hey, look, friend, you might hide something from your wife. You might hide something from your husband. You might hide something from your parents. But you never can hide anything from God. He has those penetrating eyes that can see all things. What a, what a vision He had of Him. And then He noticed His feet. His feet are like fine brass. That, that says to me, He's the powerful one. Brass was a symbol of judgment. And understand that one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And I said to you a couple of weeks ago, it's going to be grief for the sinner, but it's going to be gladness for the saint. It's going to be grief for the sinner because He's coming back to judge. He's coming back to judge sin. Somebody, sometimes people say, well, preacher, just, just not fair. No, life isn't sometimes fair. But guess what? One day it's going to all be made right. And Jesus Christ is the one who's going to make it all right. And then you'll notice His voice. It talks about His voice. It was as the sound of many waters. That says to me He's the proclaiming one. You ever thought about the voice of Jesus? I, I, I've wished a lot of times, I wished I could have been there to hear just how Jesus put a tone to certain things. Wouldn't you love to have just known that? Wouldn't you love to have just been there when Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Could you imagine the tone of love? Could you imagine the tone of compassion? Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ as He describes Him here, the voice of many waters. And then notice He said, it, 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 He had in his, his right hand the seven stars. He's talking about the hand. That's, that's the, uh, the, the, the place of, of protection. The right hand was the hand of authority. And so isn't it wonderful to know that you're in His hand this morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
You know what the Bible says? I got them in my hand. And it says nobody, no one can pluck them out of my hand. Talk about a place of security. There it is right there, the hand of Jesus. And then notice he talks about his mouth. He says his mouth went as a sharp two-edged sword. He's the piercing one. The Bible talks about the Word of God being a sharp two-edged sword that cuts in areas that your eye can't even see. Oh, we have these lasers that do amazing cuts today. But I want to tell you, there is nothing that can cut as deep and there is nothing that can cut as quick as the Word of God when you dig in to God's Holy Word. And then there's the countenance, the face. He says it was like the sun shining in its strength. I hunted for a P word that would fit with that one. The, word, the best one I could get was palatial. Now, that ain't an Owasa word, I can tell you right now. I, I didn't go around learning palatial. I don't know if I can even spell it right now. But, but, I, but it means magnificent. It's the best word I could find to describe our magnificent face on our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to, and you notice he says it's going to shine. It, it, it's shining above the sun in its strength. At that time in the day when the sun is the strongest, the face of Jesus is outshining that sun. In fact, do you know what? I think that's a picture of the glory of God right there. That Shekinah glory of God. In fact, one of these days we ain't going to need no pioneer or... or it ain't pioneer in Connecticut though, is it? It's something else. But uh, what is it? Southern pine in Connecticut. We don't want to leave anybody out. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, and, but, but you're not going to need that and you're not going to need any Alabama power you know why? because the book of Revelation when we get over there to those last chapters is going to say that the light of that city is going to be the face of the Lord Jesus Christ isn't that going to be something one of these days he describes him in unbelievable ways the Lord Jesus Christ now quickly let me move to the last thought and that is the reaction to the vision we, we've talked about the revealer of the vision we talked about the recipients of the vision and the revealing of that vision. But what is the reaction? What happened to John when he saw all this? When he got in the presence of God, when he had an encounter with God? Notice what the Bible says happened to him. No, no, notice what, he, what, what it says he did. In verse 17 he said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You know, I've had some people rather, rather pridely say, but I just tell you one thing, preacher. When I get to heaven, I got some things I'm going to tell God. <laughs> like they own heaven. Now, I tell you what we all going to do. What John did. Going to fall on our face. That's what we're going to do. We're going to hit the dust. That's what we're going to do. Why did he do that? As I looked at these verses, there were just three things that God put on my heart. Number one, because he encountered God's truth. He encountered truth. He saw Jesus. Not that, as I said, lowly Galilean. Oh, he saw the reigning Lord coming back with all his glory and dignity and power and majesty. Boy, he just fell. You know, I got studying that. Do you know that that's the experience of all people when they come under the truth of God and they actually encounter God's truth? You remember Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Moses saw that burning bush and he went over there to look and he heard that voice coming out of that bush. That's enough to get you on your feet, off your feet right there, wouldn't it? A bush talking, burning up, but it ain't burning up. And, and, and he heard that voice. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says Moses covered his face and he was afraid. That's what the Bible says. He encountered the presence of Almighty God. <clears throat> Do you remember Job? Job went through that whole book, all the ups and downs and all the discussion about God and wanting to talk to God and all that. And you get over there to that 42nd chapter and verse 5 and he came into the presence of God and he said, I, I've heard you with the ear, but now I see you with the eye and I abhor myself and repent in dust from a heart. Isn't that something? That's what. Remember Isaiah when he got that vision in chapter 6? And, and when he saw it, he said, Lord... He said, depart from me because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You remember Peter in, in Luke uh, uh, 5, 8 when he had that miracle and, and they'd been fishing and couldn't catch nothing and, and Jesus said, well, just throw it on the other side. Just throw it over there. And man, nets started squeaking and cords start breaking and fish have that thing filled up and Simon Peter said depart from me O Lord I'm a sinful man he recognized he was in the presence 
of a living God. Boy, I tell you, that's what happened to us when we really encountered God's truth. I tell you another thing that caused him to do what he did. Not only did he encounter God's truth, but he experienced God's touch. Oh, the touch of God. Isn't that something? Haven't you experienced that? The touch of God. There he is. He's just down in the dust. And then he feels a hand. And that hand is the hand of God. You know, when I was coming along, we used to sing a little song. I don't know if y'all ever sang it here, but we used to sing them. Maybe we ought to bring it back. But, uh, it, it, and it would, we'd have, it was on, usually on Sunday nights when we did it. And it went something like this. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. It must have been the hand of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And then we would sing, It was on a Monday. Somebody touched me. It was on a Monday. It's my only solo. It was on a Monday. Somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. And we'd go through the whole week. And you know what? I'd sit there waiting on. It was my, on a Friday. Somebody touched me. Boy, I'd stand up, you know, because it was on a Friday in a revival meeting that God touched me. Aren't you grateful for the touch of God this morning, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, you see, it's His touch that comes. It's His touch that converts. It's His touch that cleanses. It's His touch that commissions. It's His touch that comforts. He experienced the truth, God's truth. He, he experienced God's touch. He encountered God's truth. He experienced God's touch. And then notice, He embraced God's teaching. He embraced God's teaching. Notice what the Lord said to him. The Lord said, don't be afraid. Isn't that good? Don't be afraid. John, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid as to whether you ever get off Patmos or not. You don't have to be afraid about what's coming in the future. I already sung about it this morning. Because why? Well, he's already there. He's already there. He's waiting. And then notice what he said. I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. And I'm alive forevermore. Hey, that's a good place for an amen, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> he, he, he embraced God's truth. He accepted what God said, that He was the one who was alive, He was the one who was dead, and He was the one who is alive forevermore. Oh, boy. And notice what Jesus said. I got the keys. You notice that? I, I, I got the keys. I have the keys of hell and death. You know, I don't know if it happened this way or not. I try to imagine in my mind's imagination. Try to imagine. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, death with his old, clammy, cold, bony fingers put his hands around the precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ and hauled him off to the tomb. Could you imagine that? One day passed, two days, three days. Boy, then things start shaking in that old tomb. And the Lord Jesus Christ, could you imagine, gets up. And with one nail-scarred hand, he reaches over there and takes old death, throws him down on the floor. And with the other nail-scarred hand, he reaches down and pulls the stinger out of death. And then, with one of those nail-pierced feet, he puts his old foot on the body of old death. And then he looks at that tomb with a stone rolled away. And with a voice loud enough for the angels in heaven to hear him, he says, Old death, where is your sting and old grave? Where is your victory? Brother, you ain't got to be worried. You don't have to be afraid. He's walking around with the keys. He walked out with the keys that day, ladies and gentlemen, and he still has got the keys. And I've got news for you when we get to the end of this book. You know what he's going to do? He's going to take the devil. He's going to take the demons. And he's going to take those who don't know him. He's going to cast them in a bottomless pit, lock the door, and throw out a key. Because this is our Jesus one of these days, ladies and gentlemen, Amen. that's coming back. Now the question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? See, that's the question. He's the key. But you know what the Bible says? He's the door. And if you'll open the door, guess what? You can go in. And he'll sup with you and you with him. You can have fellowship with him. And one of these days, enjoy that 
for all eternity. Because this is the ruling one who's coming back one of these days. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Gracious Father, thank you so much for your precious word. And Lord, how I pray that we'll respond to you as the Jesus you are. The Savior, the Redeemer, the soon coming Lord, the ruler and king of this earth. And may we allow you to be in our lives ruler and king as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is 185, whiter than snow. 185. Would you turn to that? And we're going to stand together and we're going to sing that invitation this morning. Would you stand together with me? Amen. Amen. John, if y'all would come and and stand with me. Amy, Holler, Matt, (laughs) Bra. And we are delighted to have them today. I had the privilege of talking with Johnny uh, this past, uh, well, maybe two weeks ago now, I guess it was. And and, uh, he had talked to me about becoming a member today. And uh, Pam, uh, uh, Amy, had been baptized. And and, uh, their Methodist church is where they they were attending. Uh, But at Johnny's request, we're going to hold off baptism on them. We want to be baptized uh, until... It warms up a little bit. (laughs) Because here's the request. The creek. That's where they want it done. So we're going to... Right. Right. But we want to do it the Methodist church. Right. 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 I got you. I got you. Good deal. Good deal. So, so he he won't, and he, he that was his request. He wanted wanted to do it in the creek. So, hey, when it warms up, we're gonna get that done for him. All right. Uh, those of you who, who join me in, in just welcoming them, accepting them into our fellowship today, would you let me know by just saying I? Right. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all so much. I'm gonna let y'all go to the back. All right. And uh, so it's so thankful to have them and, and uh, have them a part of, of our fellowship. We'll look forward to uh, that, that scheduling uh, as, uh, as, as it warms up a little bit, all right? Thank you so much for being here today. Man, what a wonderful crowd. What a wonderful spirit. It's good to be able to come to church in the spirit, amen? And we got that, and I'm thankful for it. I really, really am. Let, let, let's bow together as we go to the Lord uh, in, in prayer today. Uh, Brother Jimmy uh, Conway, would you dismiss us, please, sir? Heavenly Father, as we come to this service today, we thank you, Lord, because you are in our presence. You are, Lord, our Savior. You are the one that heals our wounds. You are the one, Lord, that loved us so much that uh, gave your only son to die on the cross for us. Father, this morning we have so much to thank you for because you send us a preacher like Brother Herbert that can explain your word the best that we can for us to understand it, and I thank you for that messenger. I pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to uh, look at this book of Revelation and what it means in our lives to us, for us, and pray, Lord, that you would speak through him that it might touch our hearts that we might serve you in a way, Lord, that's pleasing in your sight. Lord, I pray this morning that you would bless this family that has come. I pray that you would be with them and undergird them in the service here and may we as the brothers and sisters in Christ lift them up and and show them how much we love them and then Lord that we might move on together as a church family of God forgive us Lord for whether we fail you we thank you so much for blessing us in thy name we ask Amen. Amen. amen